It feels like an eternity since I last made a good creepy video, especially one involving unsolved mysteries. So, from a lighthouse where all of the keepers vanished under very strange circumstances, to a man who visited a cave near the notorious Nellis Air Force Base in the middle of the Nevada desert and never returned. Here are five of some of the creepiest unsolved mysteries I can find. So as always, hit those lights, kick back and enjoy. The Ellen Moore Lighthouse. In 1895, construction started on a lighthouse on one of the uninhabited Flannan Islands in Scotland. The lighthouse was completed in 1899 and was lit on December the 7th, being manned by three keepers, Thomas Marshall, James Ducat, and Donald MacArthur, who were responsible for maintaining the paraffin-powered light. But in the middle of December 1900, just a year after the men had been stationed there, the light went out. At the time, the weather was treacherous, and it wasn't until Boxing Day that a ship captained by James Harvey and carrying replacement lightkeeper Joseph Moore was able to reach the island, after numerous reports of the light's failure. As the ship reached the landing platform not far from the lighthouse, they were surprised that none of the keepers were waiting for their arrival. Harvey blew his horn and sent up a warning flare to alert the keepers, but there was no response. Joseph rode ashore, but as he reached the lighthouse, he realized something was very wrong. The lighthouse door was unlocked, and one of the three oiled skin jackets was still hanging on its peg. In the kitchen was half-eaten food and overturned chairs, and even the wall clock had stopped. There was no sign of the three keepers, so Moore returned to the ship and Captain Harvey ordered a search of the island. An official telegram was sent to the mainland and further searches of the island were conducted, but nothing further was found apart from some unusual entries in the lighthouse log. On the 12th of December, Marshall wrote, severe winds, the likes of which I've never seen before in 20 years. He also noted that principal keeper Ducat had been very quiet, and MacArthur, known to be a particularly tough man, had been crying. On the 13th, it stated that all three men were praying as the storm raged. The final entry was two days later, on the 15th of December, which simply read, Storm ended, sea calm, God is over all. What was strange about this was that according to weather reports, the storm did not hit the island until the 17th of December, five days after Marshall's first mention of it. So what had happened to the three men? Well, there are a few theories. Ropes were found strewn on the rocks by the landing platform. These were ropes that were used on the supply crate. So was it possible the men tried to retrieve the ropes after they came free from the supply crate and were swept away by a huge wave? The problem with this is, bodies lost at sea will usually wash up, but none of the three bodies ever have. And if they did go out to the lighthouse, then why did one of them leave behind his coat if it was severe weather? These were experienced lighthouse keepers and knew what they were doing. Others have suggested one of the men killed the other two, but this does not hold up well. After the unexplained event, the many keepers who inhabited the Ellen Moore after this tragic incident often reported strange voices in the wind and swear they were calling out the names of the lighthouse keepers. It was later found out that the original land the lighthouse was built on was named after the 6th century bishop who built a small chapel there. This chapel was very feared from the local shepherds, who said that spirits haunted the area. This led to the thoughts that the lighthouse keepers were scared by some paranormal force, possibly causing them to flee the safety of their lighthouse, and meet their death in some unknown way. Whatever the cause, the disappearance of these three men remains a complete mystery, and means the Flanagan Island, its creepy chapel ruins, and its now automated lighthouse are still talked about to this day. The Exorcism of Latoya Ammons. This next story was published in the Indie Star in January 2014, and to date is the most read article ever to feature in their newspaper, and after hearing it, you'll see why. In 2011, Latoya Ammons, her three children, and her mother moved into a rented house in Gary, Indiana, and from the start, they were plagued by huge black flies that kept returning even after supposedly being exterminated. The family then started hearing noises coming from the basement, and on one occasion, Ammons' 12-year-old daughter was seen levitating unconscious above her bed. After seeking advice from the church and attempting to rid the house of evil using a Bible, things supposedly got a whole lot worse. So bad, in fact, the children were often hospitalized after falling unconscious while apparently being possessed and chanting satanic verses. On one occasion, after two of her sons were taken to the hospital, 
A nurse and CPS worker apparently witnessed one of them being moved by an unseen force. Police and medical staff were concerned that Latoya had some kind of mental disorder and was encouraging her children to behave this way, but she fiercely denies this. Unable to explain the children's behaviour, officials took emergency steps to take custody of them, saying they were experiencing spiritual and emotional distress. A Catholic priest was called in and did an intense blessing on the house to expel bad spirits, and allegedly performed three exorcisms on Latoya. All of this was legitimately performed, with the police and authorities being informed, although none of them witnessed the actual exorcisms. Six months after her children were removed, they returned to their family, who by now had moved to Indianapolis, and have since settled into their new home. Ammons maintains that it was not psychologists that resolved her problems, but God. She also said, when you hear something like this, do not assume it's not real, because I've lived it, I know it's real. After the article had been published, the original house was purchased by ghost hunter Zach Bagans, who arranged for the family to return to the house as part of a documentary he was making, but he has since had the house demolished. There's obviously a lot more to this story than what I can fit in in this video, and the original article is a very interesting read. So was this just another money-making venture, or was Latoya Ammons possessed by an unknown force that was terrorising her family? What do you think? The Moving Coffins of the Chase Family Vault Christchurch Parish Church in Barbados has a chequered past. The current building is the fifth church built for the parish after the previous four were damaged by floods and hurricanes, and in the case of the fourth, burnt to the ground. The present church was built in 1935 and retained three of the walls from the burnt out ruin. However, it is not the church that is mysterious, but the graveyard. To be more precise, the Chase Vault and its mysterious moving coffins. The story starts in 1808 when the Chase family purchased a vault in the Christchurch graveyard for the burial of their infant child, Mary Ann Marie. The vault was made of concrete and coral and was entered via stone steps and sealed by a huge slab of marble. However, the tomb was not vacant and already held the body of a lady called Mrs. Goddard, who had been buried there the year before. The Chase family thought it was disrespectful to move her wooden coffin, so left it in the vault alongside their daughter's lead casket. Sadly, just four years later, a second daughter also died at the age of four, supposedly starving herself after being abused by her father. Her lead casket was placed alongside her sister in the vault. Just a month after her death, her father, Thomas Chase, committed suicide. Thomas was prepared to be placed in the vault alongside his daughters, but when the vault was opened, instead of the neat row of coffins that had been left after the previous funeral, just Goddard's was still in place. The other two caskets had been moved, and the tomb had been ransacked. The devastated family feared the vault had been targeted by grave robbers, so arranged to have the caskets put neatly back into their original position, before laying Thomas's 240 pound casket alongside them. The huge marble stone was again rolled back to seal the vault. The next death was 11 year old Charles. Again, the vault was opened only to find the chase coffins displaced and tossed around, although the seal of the tomb had not been tampered with. Again, the coffins were returned to their original position and news traveled fast, so the public started to take an interest in the tombs with reports of spooked horses and shrieks being heard from within the vault. Between 1816 and 1819, two more family members were laid to rest, and each time, the original chase caskets were rearranged when the tomb was opened. The governor of Barbados had also been told of the story and had the tomb inspected and sealed with mortar. He also had the floor of the tomb dusted with a fine white sand to capture evidence of anyone breaking in. After eight months, he returned and externally everything was in order, but when the door was opened, the caskets were again thrown around the vault. This time, Mary Ann's coffin had been thrown with such force that its corner had broken off. This was the final straw, and all of the bodies in the vault were removed and buried separately, finally allowing them to rest in peace. As for the vault, well, it has remained empty and open ever since. As always, with these handed down stories, some versions differ slightly, and there are some who think that it's just an urban myth. However, there was definitely a Chase family living in the area at the time, and it seems that whatever happened to them in life meant they could not rest harmoniously in death. The only one unaffected was the unrelated Mrs. Goddard, whose wooden coffin supposedly never moved an inch. Jeffrey Daniels 
In November 1997, a man calling himself Jeffrey Daniels checked into the Super 8 Motel in Aiken County, South Carolina. On the first night of his stay, he ordered a pizza but failed to answer his door when delivery was attempted. Staff became concerned when they spotted the Do Not Disturb notice pinned on his door that had the message, I am not responsible for the consequences, handwritten on the back. When they decided to enter the room, it was unusually neat and tidy. A Super Nintendo was on, a jacket was hanging neatly on a coat rack, and brand new clothes were neatly folded in the dresser. In the bathroom was toothpaste, nail clippers, and cotton buds lined up neatly on the vanity shelf, and on the floor was the dead body of Jeffrey Daniels. It was thought he had killed himself sometime between the 10th and the 13th of November, meaning he was already dead when the pizza man knocked his door. However, this was not a straightforward suicide. Investigations revealed many unanswered questions. The biggest one, who was this man, as he was certainly not Jeffrey Daniel. Motel workers recalled that he had no identification on him, telling them that he wanted to leave all that behind, and had prepaid for his room with cash. It was later discovered that he had used the name Jeffrey Daniels during previous weeks, and had also given a fake social security number and New York address when he was hospitalized after a failed suicide attempt in another motel. The real Jeffrey Daniels did not know this man and was alive and well. The Jeffrey Daniels imposter was described as 35 to 40 years old and around 6 foot 2, weighing 220 pounds. He had scars on his face and had longish brown hair with brown eyes. He was also a smoker and maybe had stomach problems as indigestion tablets were found in his room, along with prescription medication with the labels peeled off the bottles, supposedly to hide his true identity. The coroner noted he was a well-groomed, well-spoken man and was obviously concerned about his appearance. It was revealed that in a previous suicide attempt, he built a tent out of cellophane and tried to suffocate himself as well as slashing his wrists. The hospital he was sent to later said he was unwilling to accept help. The method of his successful suicide was never made public, so we may never know how exactly he died. To date, this man is still unidentified, and it makes you think, why did he not want to be named or identified? When you hear the heartfelt appeals from family looking for missing loved ones, perhaps this man could be one of them, as this case has not had a huge amount of publicity, and the identity of Jeffrey Daniels and his cause of death remains unsolved. Kenny Veach this is a strange one. 47-year-old Kenny Veach was an experienced hiker, and his passion was exploring the vast Nevada desert. He described himself as a daredevil and cowboy who enjoyed playing with rattlesnakes and his pet tarantula, and his disappearance is one of the strangest I've heard about. It starts with a comment he left on a YouTube video called Son of an Area 51 Technician. This ain't nothing. I'm a long-distance hiker, one time during one of my hikes out by Nellis Air Force Base, I found a hidden cave. The entrance to the cave was shaped like a perfect capital M. I always enter every cave I find, but as I began to enter this particular cave, my whole body began to vibrate. The closer I got to the cave entrance, the worse the vibrating became. Suddenly, I became very scared and hightailed it out of there. That was one of the strangest things that ever happened to me. His comment generated a lot of interest and debate and some people suggested that he provide proof of this cave. While that is exactly what Kenny did, he ventured out into the desert and recorded his trip, although he was unable to locate the mysterious M cave. Despite this, he uploaded the video to his YouTube channel. Again, this video generated a lot of interest, and Kenny seemed determined to make a third trip in search of the cave. At the time, he posted, I will have my 9mm with me this time, just in case. It's a 10 hour hike, no trails, very dangerous terrain. Despite pleas from people who realized the potential danger Kenny was putting himself into just to prove the cave existed, he seemed determined to find it and prove his claims. On November the 10th, 2014, he headed out alone to the unforgiving desert in search of the elusive cave for the last time. After he failed to come home, his worried family and friends alerted the authorities and a search party was sent out. They found his phone near a disused vertical mine shaft, and it was assumed Kenny had fallen to his death. However, after an extensive search of the mine and surrounding area, nothing was found. The most likely explanation was that Kenny met one of the many hazards associated with the terrain, possibly losing his footing somewhere, becoming dehydrated, or even being attacked by a wild animal. 
As always, there are plenty of theories about what happened to Kenny. One of them is that he inevitably stumbled upon something he shouldn't have, aka the strange M cave. And as a result, something happened to him. There is also speculation that Kenny faked his own death, as at the time of his disappearance, his business venture was failing, he was unemployed and was spiralling into debt. But in another twist, his girlfriend posted this extraordinary comment on his MK video, suggesting that he had committed suicide, which many found very strange and eerie. It's a long comment, so I'll break it down. I am the girlfriend that Kenny spoke of in the video. I want you to know that I do not think Kenny had an accident. I believe he committed suicide. He battled depression for many years and would not take medication or see a doctor. He quit his job a little more than a year before he disappeared. His father committed suicide when Kenny was in his early 20s. He asked me what I would think of him if he committed suicide. He also said if he decided to do it, no one will ever find me. It would be easy to do something like this in our desert with the number of natural caves and mines. They found his car in the area I told them it would be. They did find his cell phone by the mine shaft in the video. The mine shaft was only about a four hour hike from his car. It is my feeling that he left it behind so he could not be tracked from the GPS in it. He also did not take his video camera with him on his solo hike. As you can imagine, there are those who believe he did not commit suicide and that the M cave holds the answers to what happened to Kenny. The reason for this is the cave was supposedly near the Nellis Air Force Base, which has a long history of conspiracy stories, ranging from there being an extensive network of tunnels beneath it, housing secret research projects and classified military secrets. Then there are others who believe there is an underground base protecting aliens, who are being used for experiments, and some say the cave could have been a portal to another dimension. Another thought along these lines is that the cave produced some strange echoes and frequencies, which can have a profound effect on the human body. The frequency of 110 Hz can be found at certain depths and are thought to influence human senses, even if the person is not aware of it. So it makes you wonder if this is what Kenny experienced the first time he discovered the cave and the same thing drew him back in with tragic consequences. Whatever happened to Kenny, his departure has left his family and friends devastated. So if anyone can shed any light on his disappearance or the mysterious M cave, then I am sure they would appreciate any suggestions and support. So that's five creepy unsolved mysteries. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.